Good day, everyone. Uh, I'm Ian Preston. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the state of the art of private data on IPFS. Uh, so most services at, at the moment online uh, choose one of either, either privacy or speed. Uh, now, is it, is it possible to have both? Uh, we believe the answer is yes, and that's our guiding principle in Pyrgos. What is Pyrgos? Uh, it's a global private file system um, that I've given loads of talks in the past, but that's the TLDR. Uh, the human readable paths map via IPFS and through uh, signatures to uh, private data. So the first part of this talk, I'm going to tell you about the, some of the privacy features. So the capability-based access control. Uh, BATS, which are, which are part of that, which are a, a low-level, uh, block-level access control. Uh, Cryptree Plus and uh, application sandbox. And then I'm going to tell you about the speed, uh, some of the speed improvements we've done, some of the cool stuff. Uh, concurrent GC, fast seeking in arbitrarily large files, and direct S3 access. So let's start with capabilities. Uh, what is a cap? Uh, so it's, it's pure information. It's not identity based. So if you have this information through whatever means, you can use that capability. Uh, there are three kinds of capabilities, uh, mirror, read, and write. So the mirror capability doesn't actually let you read anyone's data. Uh, it lets you duplicate or, or, or retrieve the, the encrypted data. So that's a ciphertext level access control. So a mirror capability has uh, a bunch of things in it. Um, there's an owner and a writer, which are both public keys. There's a map key, which is it's just a label, but it's 32 random bytes. Uh, and the bat, uh, which we'll talk more about later, which is also 32 random bytes. So if you have a mirror key and you add uh, a symmetric key, um, that, that turns it into a read capability. And if you add one more symmetric uh, key, uh, then it turns it into a write capability. Uh, so capabilities can be revoked uh, basically by key rotation. Because it's pure information, they can work in things like secret links. Uh, so you can share them with anyone via a URL. So I'm going to take you through the process of, say I've given you a read capability to a file, what, what do you have to do to actually, what are the steps that, that happen to, to get the actual file contents? So uh, in Pegos, there's a PKI, which is basically a mapping, uh, a global mapping from username to signed claims of username, host peer ID, and your identity public key. So two public keys, basically, one for your host, one for your identity. Um, and normally, we, you, normally you mirror that, so you can do private lookups locally. Uh, and so you, you build a reverse index from uh, identity to peer ID. Once you've got the peer ID of the capability you're trying to retrieve, you do a peer-to-peer -peer HTTP request to get what we call a mutable pointer uh, for that writer. So all that is is a signed thing. Uh, that thing is, is at the bottom here. You can see it has... Uh, the previous root CID, uh, which that thing pointed to, if there was one, uh, and the current CID, and uh, a sequence number, which is monotonically increasing. So once you've got this mutable pointer, you've, you verify the signature uh, and the sequence, if you've ever seen it before, um, and then take out the root CID. With the root CID, you do a second peer-to-peer -peer HTTP request to to the, the peer ID, the owner. You don't have to do it this way. This is just the fastest way. You can do it totally locally using block by block lookups in the DHT, but, but that's obviously slower. Um, but, but if, but if they're your, the host is offline, then you can, you can fall back to that. Um, <clears throat> so you do a, a champ.get. So uh, champ is just a, it's a compressed hash ray mapped prefix try. It's a Merkle structure. Um, you, you supply the root, uh, the map key you're trying to look up and the bat. And that returns basically just a list of blocks. Uh, you then locally then repeat the champ lookup locally using those return blocks. So there's no, there's no trust relationship here. Um, and then you've got, you finally got the, the thing that the, that map key maps to, the value. Um, and then you can decrypt that with the, with the read key from the capability. And that gives you then the metadata for the file. So things like file name, modification time, MIME type. And within that metadata, there are also, if the, if the file is less than 4K, 
you've actually already got the data. It's inlined, um, which is a, a small optimization we do. But if it's more than 4K, then there'll be some links to other to the blocks. Um, so files are they're split into five megabyte chunks. Each chunk will have its own capability and crypt tree node. So uh, if you want to get uh, the blocks for a chunk, there's a, at most five. We go up to one megabyte blocks, um, and you just you retrieve those using the CIDs and the bats, which are in the, the metadata you just retrieved, and then concatenate them and decrypt it. And that gives you then the first up to five megabytes of the file. So to calculate the subsequent capabilities for the, for the file, basically you just do some hashing. So the, the map key, the label that you're looking up, you hash that with a secret that is in the metadata that you've decrypted, and that gives you the next map key. And the same thing applies to the bats. We'll, we'll, we'll spell that out later. And then you just repeat the previous the five to, steps five to ten. These guys, so the champ get, and then get the blocks. So that's how that's how you get a file. Uh, but I keep talking about these bat things. What 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 are bats? Um, so it stands for block access token. So I've said they're the 32 random bytes. But the, the the sort of guiding principle here is, you shouldn't be putting encrypted data in the public DHT, because um, you open yourself up to attacks where someone can just store everything that's in the DHT and try and decrypt it later or do offline attacks, or maybe the, the encryption is broken at some point or something like that. So you, you want to have some kind of access control. Um, so with the BATS, uh, we've, we've uh, created this, it's post-quantum uh, ciphertext level access control. Um, the idea is there, we have, there are two BATS per block, and if you want to retrieve a block, then as well as sending the CID, you send an auth token. So the auth token is an S3v4 signature. It's nothing to do with S3. It's just the same signature algorithm, um, which, is, which ends up being 89 bytes, which you send with the CID. So it's a sm small overhead um, in terms of bandwidth. And th that signature critically is tied to the requesting peer ID. So you can broadcast this auth token to the DHT, and it doesn't matter. No one can replay it. Um, and it's also limited in time as well, so something like five minutes. So the recipient will uh, verify the signature, obviously against the requesting peer ID, and uh, the bat. Now, one of the properties we wanted to maintain uh, for IPFS here is the kind of auto-scaling property. So if there's some content in IPFS and it's popular, lots of people request it, they can then help to serve up the same content so you get this the supply scaling with the with the demand uh, the other way around yeah supply scaling with the demand kind of thing uh, and we wanted to get to, to maintain that um, so the way we do that uh, is one of the bats is in the block itself so that means if you've retrieved the block you automatically have the bat it's in the block uh, if you want to rotate access you change the bat that changes the CID it's a new block. Um, so that way you get that auto-scaling property can be maintained and uh, anyone who who's authorized to request it can then continue to apply the same uh, authorization. So the inline bat, so the question is where, where do we put them? Um, so we only have two kinds of blocks. There's, it's all DAG CBOR, which is CBOR or, 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 or RAW. Um, so CBOR, you can actually have different top-level objects. You could have a list, but we don't actually care about those. Uh, all of the relevant objects that we care about have a map at the top level. So if it's a map, it's easy. You just, you just pick a key. We picked bats, and then that maps to an inline, uh, a seaboard list of two, uh, two bats. Uh, raw blocks are a little bit more difficult because there isn't really any structure in a raw block. Um, there is actually a little bit. There is a beginning. So... <laughs> So we, the, what we decided on here was there's a, an eight-byte magic prefix to basically say this, this is a, an access controlled block. Uh, and then after that, we just have the, the CBOR list of the two, uh, the two bats after it, which ends up being uh, eight bytes and 77 bytes. Uh, so uh, in our case, the, the blocks we're trying to access control, their minimum size is, is 8K, uh, and they go up to one meg. So it's, it's not a huge overhead. Uh, so now, what, what is what is Cryptree Plus? So, 
It's Cryptree plus BATS that I've just mentioned, plus uh, improving the design from a post-quantum perspective and protecting as much metadata as possible. So I've said the Cryptree nodes are stored as values in a champ under the corresponding key. Uh, your, your data host or, or storer, I mean, there might be more than one, but they can't link the different chunks of the same file, so they can't see your file size. Uh, we also pad the files to a multiple of 4K within that chunk size. Uh, so that gives you whatever it is, 5 meg uh, divided by 4K, 1,280 possible sizes in the whole world um, for a chunk. And at the same time, uh, you can't tell the difference between a directory uh, and a file because they, they look the same. Uh, so yeah, in terms of other things, the, the metadata privacy protects in Cryptree, uh, Cryptree Plus. So yeah, I've said file sizes, whether something is a file or directory, the file or folder names, uh, the lengths of the names of the files or folders, the folder topology, uh, the social graph is not visible, uh, who or how many have access to a file is also not visible. Basically, that, that comes down to it because the capabilities are pure information. We can't tell how many people you have told that information to even with the in-band sharing mechanism. So a Cryptree node, this is, how it, this is the format, how it looks like to, on the block level. So there are a bunch of, the, the, the bats I mentioned are there. Um, they, they have to be readable by the server because the server's enforcing that, access, that level of access control. And then there, there are three uh, encrypted, uh, padded and encrypted sections. Um, there's a, a a link to a second symmetric key, so there are two keys for each thing. I'll show you in a second. Uh, if you've granted write access to something, there's also a symmetric link to the key pair, which you need to authorize those writes. Um, and there's a relative capability to the subsequent chunk. Uh, that's only actually really needed for directories, as I, as I mentioned for the, for the file thing. Um, there's a, a parent section, which has uh, an optional parent link, it's, that's there, unless it's your root directory, basically, that's always there. Uh, and then there's the file properties, which is a kind of extensible thing where you can just put stuff. So that has the file name, uh, MIME type, um, file size, uh, modification time, thumbnails. Um, and then finally, there's the, the children or data. So if it's a directory, it's children. If it's file, it's data. You don't know until you decrypt it. Um, and that could be inlined, as I mentioned, if it's less than 4K, a small file or, or a medium-sized directory. Um, otherwise, it's got a list of CIDs and, and corresponding BATs. So this is how the, the read cryptry looks like. So there are two symmetric keys for each file or directory. Uh, if you have a symmetric key, the idea is you can follow those arrows by decrypting links uh, in, the, in the metadata you retrieve. You'll notice there's these backlinks going back up the tree uh, from the file, so that's so that everything has a well-defined path. And the write crypt trees are a, a, a lot simpler. There's only one symmetric key per thing, um, and most of the time that's not even there because it's only there if you, you need to grant write access to something. So in, a, in terms of a directory, what's actually what a, what is a directory? So I mean. Semantically, it's a list of children. Um, so in, in, theoretically, that should be a list of capabilities. Uh, but we want to we want to be able to revoke access quite fast. And if we have to change an entire subtree when we're revoking access to something, then that's expensive. Um, so we use a relative capability, which makes that more efficient. Uh, and the other thing we care about is find by path, get by path. Um, if you, if, in, if, if you have a directory and if you have to retrieve all the things to find their name to, f to go to the next level, that's obviously slow. So we, have, uh, we duplicate the name in the parent directory so you end up with named relative capabilities uh, or this, this thing at the bottom. So a directory is a list of things which have name, an optional writer, uh, a map key, a bat, and a read key. The application sandbox we have in Pyrgos uh, is the most recent development. So the idea here is you, you can run untrusted code over private data. So an app shouldn't be able to exfiltrate data or steal it. Uh, app, an app can't read anything that it's not been granted access to. 
uh, and it works in existing browsers without add-ons. Uh, also works offline sometimes. Uh, what, what, is it, what is an application? It's just a folder, basically, of, of HTML5 assets. Um, so, in, in Peergos, um, so because it's just a folder in Peergos, the author controls the visibility. You can have private apps. You can share it with your friends. You can make it public. Um, we've got a basic set of permissions you can give to apps. Uh, I gave a talk on this earlier, so I'm just going to summarize it here. But um, if you want more details, go, go watch that. Um, yeah, super easy publishing, drag and drop. Uh, we've got a bunch of example apps. Uh, you can find these, and there's an example dash apps repo in, in Peergos on GitHub. Uh, Markdown, there's multiplayer games, image editors, music players, uh, office viewers and editors, spreadsheets, lots of stuff. So the sandbox itself, uh, how, does, how does this work? Uh, it's quite difficult to to stop exfiltration in browsers. So the idea is you've got the main Pegos tab, which you log into. Now this could be on localhost or, or some domain, it, it works on both. Um, and you then tell you, say you wanna launch an app. Uh, we then load a, a hash-based subdomain, uh, which again also works on localhost. And what the server does for that subdomain is it serves up a fixed static file for all subdomains, it's the same thing. Uh, and all that does is set up a service worker, which then communicates with the main tab via post messages. Um, and, and then sets, an, sets another sub iframe on its, on its own domain to load, to load the app. And the app can then, it's a page basically, it can render its assets. So you've got the, the app permission enforcer is in the, the trusted context on the other side. Um, and the CSP, there's a couple of things here. There's the CSP firewall is uh, locks down the app so that it, even if it escapes its own little iframe, it can't make any external requests to the web. So it shouldn't be able to exfiltrate data. Um, and the other thing is the, the subdomain context and the, and the main context are run in different operating system processes uh, to protect against side channel attacks. But enough of that uh, privacy, let's talk about speed. So concurrent GC uh, has historically been a problem. Um, so if you run Kubo with a, with a one terabyte block store in S3, a GC takes about 24 hours uh, whilst holding a global write lock. So that's obviously a problem. Um, so we, we, we wrote our own GC. Um, well, still, still using Kubo, but running the GC externally. Um, version one of the GC on the same block store took two hours, uh, and it's fully concurrent with no locks. Uh, version two takes seven minutes. So I'm going to tell you how we did that. So first you have to understand how writes happen in the Pegos. Um, whenever you're doing some modification, there's, there's four steps. You you start a transaction with a server, which is, it just returns you a transaction ID. And then you write your blocks, doesn't matter what they are, but every, every block write is tagged with a transaction ID. And the server just temporarily stores those pairs in, in a database, basically. Uh, when you've done whatever it is you're gonna do, you, you commit the new route to the mutual pointers, the thing I mentioned at the start. So you sign your update and, and push it, and then you close the transaction. and that removes all those things from the, from the database. So with that in mind, the GC algorithm uh, is also quite simple. It's, it's basically a mark and sweep, but so it lists the block store, it lists the GC routes, uh, lists the uncommitted writes, the ones I just mentioned. Uh, those three steps are very fast, even with S3. Listing can take, even on a terabyte, can take 10 seconds, but that doesn't really matter. Um, the mark phase was historically the slowest phase. Uh, and deletes, well, I mean, I guess it depends how much garbage you have. The delete phase will scale with how, much thing, how many things you have to delete, obviously. Um, but yeah, so we've done the, the mark reachable uh, and the delete also in parallel. Um, and that, so that was what got us down to the two hour mark. And the magic for the, the final version 
was basically to store a lookup from CID to the list of links in that block. Um, we store the size as well because we also do other stuff with keeping track of how much space a user uses. But uh, with, with just the links, you can do that mark and sweep without touching S3 at all, basically, uh, which is very cool. And the overhead in terms of size of this database, this extra database, uh, is, is very small, 0.05% of the total block store size. And yeah, you avoid having to retrieve and pass uh, all the, the blocks when you're, when you're doing your mark phase. So yeah, basically everyone should have this kind of metadata store <laughs> if you're doing anything to do with DAG traversal. And the final cool optimization we have, uh, I can demo it if we, yeah, we will have time, I think, uh, is fast file seeking. So if you have a large file, I've mentioned how you re retrieve a capability. Um, and once you've got the first chunk, or the first metadata of the first chunk, uh, you can then, just from hashing locally, retrieve, uh, generate a capability to a later section of the file. You know the size because that's in the first, the metadata of the first chunk. Um, and so then you can then do a bunch of hashing locally and then do a single champ get, so one, run, one round trip to retrieve the encrypted metadata and then put up to five block gets uh, for the fragments. Um, so this means you can jump forward uh, very, very quickly, um, which if you're doing something like streaming a movie can be, can be very useful. The, the final cool optimization is to do with uh, S3 block stores. So normally the block store is an implementation detail of a server, it's not exposed in any way. Uh, and that's how, the, this is the normal mode of operation. So the client always talks through your, your, your server and all the bandwidth and requests go through that and that then talks to S3. But that's, if you have a lot of data, that's 100% that's you know, of your bandwidth. So what we've done is uh, to allow direct S3 block store reads where the client talks directly now you can actually make it public, that might not make sense depending on your pricing model for S3. Um, so we are on the side of caution and, and still require authorization. So you still do a request to your server, <clears throat> but then the server just returns a pre-authed URL to S3. So then you can do the download uh, directly. So that offloads something like 99% of the bandwidth. Um, but the cool part is doing it for uploads. So this is a Bear in mind, this server is multi-tenant. You can have as many users as you like. They're all using the same bucket in S3. But because the, the block store is content addressed, there's no possibility for conflict. And so when you author writes with your server, uh, the pre-signed URL, well, so the, the path in S3 is the hash, basically. Um, but you can get S3 to verify the SHA-256 of the thing that you're uploading, uh, which happens to be the only hash we use. So you can, yeah, you can do direct uploads to S3, which is, yeah, awesome. So now I'm gonna do a super quick demo. Of the file, <coughs> file seeking thing. So if we can find, let me just make this bigger. If we can find a video. Uh, and my sound is off, I think. So we won't have any sound, but um, the, you can see it's playing. Um, and you can see, uh, yeah, the browser's buffered up to here kind of thing. Um, but if I want to seek some, some, some way later, there you go, that's, that's pretty fast. Um, and I can also go backwards. How, do I, how does backwards work? Um, obviously you can't reverse a hash. All we do there is we just keep the first chunk, first capability around. So we're always hashing forwards. Um, we could do something slightly smarter, but that seems to be enough. Coolio. Yeah, so yeah, you can self-host, uh, you can sign up on pegos.net um, or write apps. Uh, yeah, um, any questions? Um, so earlier when you were talking about the bats, you yep. mentioned specifically that it was um, post-quantum and that it couldn't be, that like an attacker who wanted to just hold on to encrypted data on the network 
couldn't decrypt it later. Uh, I wasn't sure I totally understood what made it post quantum. So it's it's post. So so where is it? Uh, the yeah. So the, the 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 reason it's post quantum is the S three v four signatures. They depend on HMAC SHA two fifty six, which is already post quantum. So there's nothing no asymmetric encryption or asymmetric signatures in there. So that. That's the auth scheme to retrieve a block, so that means that no one can retrieve the block in, in the first place. How does Cryptree Plus relate to systems like WNFS? Uh, you'll have to ask them about that. <laughs> <laughs> so the original Cryptree came from a, a group called Voila in 2008. Um, they had quite a cool system, and ours is very similar to theirs, but as I say, we've, we've made a bunch of improvements, mainly around the, the metadata side and the, uh, the post-quantum side. Um, Cheers.